Hi everyone, I'm Jonathan, uh, Jonathan McBride. My pronouns are he, him. I am one of the co-chairs of the Staff Pride Network for LGBT plus colleagues and allies, uh, staff and PhD students. And uh, we are delighted to uh, welcome you here today and welcome our amazing panel of wonderful, lovely people uh, that uh, I hope you feel at the end of it, uh, now that when you get to know them a little bit more, are also wonderful, lovely people. Um, I just want to say thanks to uh, our uh, social and events officer, Sarah Barnard. Um, and I will pass you over to in a moment. And our uh, comms and media officers, uh, Robbie Court and Kathy Norton, uh, who put a lot of effort into uh, all three of them into making this event happen. Uh, tonight. Uh, so I hope you enjoy it. Uh, it will. It is being recorded and so you will be able to share it later um, via our YouTube channel. Uh, the links to our social media uh, are in the chat. So if you don't already uh, subscribe, follow, like, uh, then please do so that you can hear more about the events that we do have and the uh, catch up uh, and the events that we've had in the past, uh, which are many. Um, so I'll uh, thank you very much for joining uh, and I'll pass you over to Sarah. Thanks, Jonathan. <laughs> Um, yeah, thank you to Jonathan um, to finish off the thank yous. Uh, so welcome everybody to Bi Plus Histories. This is one in our LGBT History Month series of events um, as in the UK, February is LGBT History Month um, and they are encouraging us. We are all encouraged to take part in celebrating by blurring borders and exploring the waves of LGBT liberation and community across the globe. Um, and we're going to do some of that today. Feel free to introduce yourself in the chat so we feel like we are speaking to an audience as much as we possibly can in this kind of post-digital landscape. Um, and if you have any questions for the panellists, uh, please pop them in the Q&A function and we'll get to them as soon as we can. Um, I want to try and make sure I do as little talking as possible because as much as I am a bisexual person, we are here to platform some other bisexual people today. Um, so I think let's get started. If you could each of you introduce yourself because I don't want to miss out any of your achievements or amazingness. So um, we have with us Sue Fletcher Watson, Dave Berry and Winnie Lamb and I'm going to go alphabetically and in the order you're on my screen and go to Dave first for a little intro, if you please. Hi, uh, my name's Dave, my name's Lee Hinn, and uh, yeah, I'm bisexual. Um, so I guess uh, I think I'm the oldest of the panelists. Um, I uh, was quite active in the Edinburgh Bisexual Group in the 1980s and 1990s, early 1990s. Um, and uh, Obviously, very out on campaigning and so forth. I can say quite a bit about what happened there um, later on. Um, at the moment, since then, I've been less active. I'm married, uh, have one son who's now grown up and uh, making his own way in the world. Um, and uh, so I'm married to a woman, to be clear. Um, and so I'm sort of in the state where my, 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 my my sexuality is less visible unless I sort of make a point of saying it. And sort of kind of got a bit um, um, content of not doing that. I've got friends and I don't know, but I'm sort of not out in campaigning so much. It's not the beliefs in the United States. Um, I guess I could say that we're all members of staff, so I do work at the uh, university. Okay. Are you, uh, there's a few comments saying that your sound is not great. Could you try moving a little bit closer to your mic, maybe? Yeah, I, I've Ooh, just. Is that better? Crystal clear. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't. We didn't pick that up in the pre um, in the, in the pre uh, session. So um, 
yeah, it turned out that uh, it was using a system microphone for a laptop that is shut, so it's not doing as well as the webcam one I've just switched to. Um, I guess we're going to have to edit this out. <laughs> <laughs> now you're, you're coming through loud and clear, and you were, you were intelligible, but okay. now you are even more so, so that's great. <laughs> thanks very much, and thanks for the intro, and it's really interesting to hear about kind of varying levels of visibility and moving from a less activist sort of position as you kind of move through your, your life um, and I'm sure we'll touch more on visibility and activism um, in the conversation uh, so thank you uh, let's hear let's have an intro to Sue Fletcher Watson please thanks Sarah um hi I'm Sue um uh oh uh what do I want to say? I, I work at the University of Edinburgh. I'm a professor of developmental psychology. Um, I work in the College of Medicine and Vet Medicine. Um, I'm a bi, I'm a cis woman, I'm married to a cis man. So um, like Dave, you know, sort of easy to be invisibly bi um, and to sort of slide into heteronormativity um uh which is something i think i did very unconsciously for a long time and then had this sort of growing sense of dissatisfaction and not feeling like people really knew me um i think it took me ages to work out why what it took me ages to work out why until i realized that oh it's because i'm bisexual and no one knows um so I got married quite young. I got married when I was 25. So it was just a long, you know, it's just, I've met a lot of people since then um, and, you know, moved to different cities and stuff like that. So there were just kind of whole swathes of my life where I was really kind of in the closet inadvertently. Um, and more recently, I've sort of consciously tried to get out of the closet and felt nervous about it and awkward about it and unsure about how to do it. Um, short of you know leaving my husband or something which I'm not keen to do um so yes yeah, so that's something I can talk about more I think that's something that's really interesting is sort of how you're out as a bi person if you're in a long-term relationship whoever you're in a long-term relationship with um and obviously that's a big part of of why we talk about bi visibility and so on um so and then more recently, I think I wonder, should I be describing myself as pansexual? But I don't know that I've thought about it enough. And I feel like there's a lot of just history of how I've identified over the years that I'm maybe not, you know, I don't like it's just very ingrained. And I don't know if I want to I don't know if I want to change how I identify myself, but I definitely don't want to. Um, <laughs> I don't want an uninclusive sexual identity. <laughs> anyway, I'm rambling a bit. I hope that that's a good introduction. That's a bit about me to get us started anyway. That's great. Thank you. And again, kind of brings up some things I definitely want to talk about, such as like, what is a bisexual identity? What's a bi plus identity? What, uh, where do we sit? Um, and again, visibility and especially visibility when you're in a monogamous relationship, which I think is all of our situations here. Um, but uh, let's hear from Winnie Lamb on any and all of those topics, but most importantly on the topic of Winnie Lamb. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so yeah, uh, my name is Winnie, um, pronouns she, they. Um, I, uh, at the university, I'm a full stack software engineer, uh, which is a bit of a mouthful. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm a developer. And uh, what else? Um, I am a cis woman um, in a relationship with another cis bi woman. So um, we've got twice the bi uh, in that, <laughs> which also seems to be a bit of a, a, a thing that people, some people have like struggled to get their head around. Um, but uh, Yes, uh, that that's how it is, um, and I guess in a in sort of a weird way because it's hard to be super visibly by when you're in a monogamous relationship. It's assumed that we're lesbians, um, 
so there's there's that but you know it's uh it's kind of in the background um and uh yeah i'm british born chinese um so yeah second generation immigrant uh born and grown up in england uh so yeah there's that aspect of me as well um yeah don't know what else to say <laughs> It's great. There's definitely a good a good foundation um, with which to go forward in our conversation. Uh, I think so. Maybe like a good foundational question is: Do you all identify, or how do you identify in terms of your sexuality? Do you do you primarily identify as bisexual, or do you use a different word to describe yourself? And how has it changed, kind of, as you've explored your identity? Um, I don't know who wants to go first. I can pick, pick on, on. Like, just, just go in order. <laughs> um, <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, so I do identify as bisexual, bi, um, and uh, been identifying this way for you know, quite a long time. Um, but when I was growing up, you know, when I was a teenager and so forth, you know, I just pretty much thought I was straight. I was attracted to women and, you know, um, maybe occasionally, but I, uh, being attracted to a man wasn't uh, really a something I recognized in myself until I fell head over heels in love with someone in the, <laughs> in the university. Um, and then I was sort of slightly confused. There wasn't a lot, a lot of information or image or around my section I was here at the time. Um, there was quite a lot of prejudice against us. Um, and so for a while there was the if you like the archetypal confused bisexual, but I was more confused. And when I adopted bisexual as an identity, um, then I actually was considerably less confused. That's where joining the um, Edinburgh Bisexual Group was really helpful because uh, you know, initially I just saw a poster on the wall, and this is well before websites and things. So I <laughs> saw a poster advertising the uh, you know, National Conference on Bisexuality, and there's a number to call. And I just found the number and said, well, I'm kind of interested in the not really interested in the politics, but they invited me along and, and um, so I never looked back. So I, I've just always picked bisexual as the identity and there's been various challenges to that over the years. But for me, that's that's cool, largely because it's the, the, the term I've always used. I don't want to sort of start shifting terminology and so forth. Yeah, I'm sympathetic to that. And I think a lot of people have, I, I certainly had the experience of, um, Wait, I'm not going to talk about myself. I'm going to move on to somebody else. <laughs> but it is the question, isn't it? Like when you've identified by that term for so long and it's kind of, well, it is obviously part of your identity, but also part of the way you organise and what do you lose by changing that? But I think mm -hmm. alternatively, what do you gain by changing that? Um, but bisexuality, yay or nay? Let's go to Sue next. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I... I just exactly what you said, Sarah, well, you know, what do you gain and what do you lose? I, I definitely identified as bi as a teenager. I feel like that was one of the identities available to me and I latched onto it quite quickly and it seemed obviously right um, in the sense that I had sort of, yeah, crushes on boys and girls at school, basically. Um, so that was all straightforward, but I don't remember pan pansexual ever being talked about. And I also don't remember ever thinking about gender in anything other than straightforward binary terms. So, you know, you can either fancy a boy or you can fancy a girl because those are the two things available to you to fancy. Um, and so much more recently, I have wondered, does bisexual describe me? But I think I think most people would agree that, that bisexual doesn't doesn't have to reinforce a gender binary and it doesn't have to mean there are two genders and I fancy both of them. You know, it, it's it's the word by, you know, we, we shouldn't load up that syllable by with too much weight, right? So, um, and I suppose, you know, if I go and look up the dictionary definitions of bisexual and, and pansexual, sometimes I do think pansexual would be a better description of 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 me but it's battling against the years of just identifying myself with a word that I feel comfortable with and and felt comfortable with as a young woman sort of 
lost for a while in my mid 20s and 30s and have got back now and is quite precious in that way and so so I think I think I'll probably just stick with it but always at pains to emphasize that and and maybe I don't need to do this but but wanting just people to know that you know I, like I don't I don't want to be seen to be sort of erasing non-binary identities or trans identities in that in that choice that I've made to label myself as bi. Mm -hmm. I can definitely see the yeah the tension there and it is kind of a externally applied tension in some ways I guess. Um, Winnie how about you where do you sit with with calling yourself bisexual? Um, yeah I, I identify as bi um, I much like Sue um, this was the term that I found first that um, fit what I felt um, and again yeah in school it seemed like you're either straight gay or bi um, and that that was basically the extent of it uh, obviously of the more recent years um, there is a lot more uh, visibility or about a gender spectrum um, and non-binary uh, identities um, and I I see it I personally see by being um, my gender and others so there's sort of a kind of plus <laughs> kind of a modifier rather than just there's just two um, and uh, again, like I agree, like uh, it's not to take anything away from trans identities or non-binary identities. Um, but I feel like for me personally, pan doesn't quite fit just in my personal definition of it. And, you know, obviously this is subject to my own kind of understanding and my own definition of these terms, which is subjective to everyone, um, that gender does play a part in how or like what aspects I'm attracted to, um, but not necessarily in just very strict binary terms. Um, so it's not such a gender blindness as it were. I'm, I'm with you on that. That's kind of where it falls for me as well. And that's why I'm kind of like, I'm bi, not pan, because gender like is a factor. And I feel like pan is often defined as gender kind of is not, <laughs> not even a consideration. But as you say, they're all very like subjective and, and people uh, take the terms um, in different ways, um, depending on the kind of their experience and what other people have kind of spoke to them about. Um, so speaking of terminology, um, I'm interested to know, like, do you, do each of you remember the first time you came across the word bisexual or came across it as an identity? Dave, you spoke about seeing it on a poster. I don't know if that was your first experience of, of bisexual. Well, I'm fairly certain the first time I heard the word bisexual was uh, David Bowie, um, <laughs> um, which is, <laughs> Does date me, but then we are we are here in history month, so <laughs> um, yeah, it was a term he used. Um, I can't remember exactly when, but I mean, I um, I didn't really identify with it at that point, but that's sort of when I first heard it. And, and one of the things about coming out as bisexual, um, sort of in that time, was that sort of if oh, you're just sort of attention seeking or you're trying to be trendy or whatever. Not that it felt very trendy, <laughs> but. Uh, um that, that was one of the ways um that, that we were put down and so forth um so yeah i think it, for, I, it must have been around as a word um i didn't really sort of pick up on what it meant or did i really identify it with it until i sort of got a bit more involved with the community um and i would say just just coming back on the trans and the gender thing um my experience of the by community in, in in that time, the 80s and 90s and, and since, is that we've always been, um, it's always been a very welcoming space for trans people. And I think partly because it's a, a non-binary space, some sense, you know, we, we are um, looking at the sort of both and view of the world instead of the either or. Um, and um, I'm not saying everybody else does, is, is 
you put in the box of it either or. But it's a space in which I think at least some trans people, or some trans friends, have felt very comfortable, or at least more comfortable than in some other parts, uh, other societies. So, um, to me, you know, the uh, the, it's the attention between bisexuals and trans. I mean, words mean what they're what they're how they're used. You, you can't look at a word and pick it apart and say, well, that um, syllable means this and this and the syllable means that and so forth. It's, um, Otherwise, the word awful would mean still mean awe inspiring. It doesn't, it means completely opposite. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's true. And I think, kind of, you know, at, the, at a very base level, you're trying to apply kind of a collection of letters to how we live and love, which is a very complicated sort of thing to try to do. Um, oh, and I should say, if anybody in the audience is a trans or non-binary bisexual person, we totally love to uh, hear your thoughts and comments, so um, please let us know. Um, but Sue and Winnie, when did you first discover bisexual? Was it David Bowie for you as well? Winnie, you go first, I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, it was not David Bowie, um, but I don't really have a specific kind of time I, I don't think that I could place I, I think it was sort of in the peripher peripheral um you know like if relatively young I remember uh, hearing some you know negative comments about bisexuality in school um again kind of like the attention seeking kind of idea um so, but it wasn't a new idea then. So I must have heard of it before, uh, but I, I can't really place it. Um, no, Pr pretty young though. Mm -hmm. That's okay. I'm not gonna fact check your. Uh... <laughs> but I feel like Sue, you, Sue was gonna say something before I started making a silly comment. <laughs> no, I, well, I suspect that I might have heard the word bi for the first time reading a magazine called More Magazine. This is now dating me. Anyone in their 40s might remember reading this as a teenager. It had, it had a position of the fortnight column. It was very racy, meaning sexual position of the fortnight, not, I don't know, yoga. Um, <laughs> so it was, quite, it was quite a kind of, for a teenage girl, it was quite a kind of, I don't know, racy magazine. And I think I got probably quite a lot of my sex education from more magazine. And I suspect they would definitely have done a profile that would be like five celebrities you didn't know were by, you know, that kind of a thing. Um, and, and it was very sex positive, actually. Like it was a really, I mean, I don't know if I look back at it now, whether I would still think that, but for the time, I think it was a very kind of, uh, it made you feel that sex was meant to be fun, which was probably a bit lacking from other ways of finding about out about sex in the nineties when I was a teenager. So that's that's my that's my assumption of where I found out about the word by. Seems like a solid one. <laughs> and kind of so so related to related to that question, I'm wondering, do you feel like bisexuality has become more visible or less visible and how has that kind of changed over your kind of your personal history and yeah thoughts <laughs> I guess I'll start with Dave again okay. um let me get us in historical order maybe um well, quite a lot of what we were doing in in the bisexual group was trying to make bisexuality more visible um because there wasn't very much media representation of it. Um, and initially, it was partly trying to get recognition within the lesbian and gay movement. So the London Bisexual Group was started, I think, when bisexuals were banned from the Lesbian and Gay Centre in London. Um, and uh, uh, so there's a bit of a response to that. Um, and there's a lot of campaigning. I remember um, A Lark in the Park, which is a sort of anti-Section 28 uh, demo. So for anybody who's young, um, Section 28 was a piece of legislation which bans the promotion of homosexuality oh, and, and uh, pretend families, I think it's in the phrase, in schools. So teachers weren't allowed to say anything about it. 
Um, and of course, this is a time when um, people could just lose their jobs for being um, gay as well, or lesbian, or bi. Um, and uh, um, so there was a big rally in uh, Prince Street Gardens, uh, and uh, Peter Tatchell was one of the speakers. Um, and he would say, you know, we have a lesbian and gay movement and lesbian and gay that. And every time he did that, the whole group was shouting, and bisexual at the top of our voices. And um, when he came back a couple of years later, he said, lesbian, gay, and bisexual. So um, <laughs> he's obviously picked up the food on that. Um, but it, then I mean, there's also sort of um, just trying to get mainstream awareness of it. Um, so uh, the other thing about you know, the 80s, of course, that was um, when AIDS first appeared. And you know, that, was, that was bad enough in itself. Um, fortunately, I didn't, none of my friends died of it. Friends offended. Um, but you know, that's all um, gay people, then in Edinburgh in particular, drug users as well. And then there were bisexual men, of course, who were spreading it from the, the deviant community into the nice upright community. In the, I have a, some, somewhere in my records, I have a note I sent, a very intemperate letter I sent to David Blunkett, who was uh, about some things he made. So, so getting visibility was actually quite difficult. Um, and in the sort of, um, around the sort of 1990 or so, we, in, in the Abai group, we set up a sort of like media subgroup and really went out and tried to get in, um, in effect, get uh, into the press in various places. I've got a photo of an article we did for Scotland on Sunday and we were on some of the the daytime TV shows like Kilroy and that sort of thing, which were sort of um, better than nothing, but not quite high profile. But there's a number of uh, attempts to do that. But yeah, there wasn't very, I don't think there was very much visibility. Um, has it improved? I think so. Um, but I maybe will let Sue and Winnie say what they think about <laughs> how visible it is now. Yeah, let's let's hear from Sue uh, going again in the in the time honoured order. And I'm also sorry, I can't speak. I'm also interested in your perception of like how how bi visibility has like changed, and also like how your own personal bi visibility has like has that kind of gone in the same trajectory, or has it diverged? Um, yeah, it's a very theoretical question for you. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, so more. Generally, in the public eye, you know, I think, I, I, yeah, bi visibility has increased, but but I am consistently disappointed by how easily people slip into gay or straight categorizations. You know, so so there was a TV show um, called Guilt or Guilty that came out a few years ago, and there was a female character who was married to a man and had an affair with a woman and I think maybe left her husband and so and and just all of the all just everything was like oh it turns out she was a lesbian you know and I thought well there's another way to interpret this woman's behavior that should at least be considered and I think I do think in kind of um you know movies tv that kind of um you know fictional storytelling it's more exciting, isn't it, that you're that you were a secretly gay person who was married to someone of the opposite sex and hiding your real identity and so on. And and of course that that does happen to real people, but I think this is it frustrates me that you can't just have a sort of healthy fluctuation in the person that you're with over the course of your life and, and you, you know and, and that you're just with different people at different stages of your life and they're different genders you know um that's I don't feel like that's a narrative we see very much even the tv show the bisexual was a woman who'd been with as I recall a woman who'd been with women most of her life and then went on this kind of sexual experimentation odyssey just sleeping with a whole load of different men you know so it was it was quite stark you know not just oh I had a girlfriend for a few years and, and now I have a boyfriend and you know I don't know so so I think that sense of the visibility is there in the sense that there are you know celebrities who are out as bisexual and so on but I still don't think it's people's go-to explanation for some of what they observe we haven't really escaped those categories um for me in terms of how visible i am i think i 
was more visible and then got a lot less visible and now I'm more visible again. And I think I got less visible not out of any process, not any conscious process at all. It was just that as a woman marrying a man and especially then going on to have two children. So, you know, I had maternity leave and I was spending time with lots of other women who were on maternity leave and, you know, and and you you go to midwife appointments and stuff and they're all asking about the father and I you know I never had to correct anyone and and so so you just slip into appearing straight without any sort of um without any reason to push back against that and then you you move to a new city and meet people and when you arrive you arrive with your two children and your husband right so of course you know well, they're idiots for assuming I'm straight but um but how do you how do you get out in the conversation that that's not who you are it's really difficult or I found it really difficult and and it I don't think it even occurred to me for a long time that that was something I wanted to do and I I used to say to my husband things like People don't know my history or people don't know, I, I, you know, I couldn't, I was like dancing around the issue. And I think I finally, finally worked out what the problem was. Um, and, um, and then there was the challenge of having finally worked out that I needed to be out and I needed people around me to know that I was by then, that you know, then there was, oh, how am I going to let them know? Um, and shout out to Jonathan McBride, my saviour, who, among other things, suggested that I put the the buy version of the Staff Pride logo in my email signature. It's such a little thing, but it made such a difference to me, actually. And I felt really brave the first time I did it. I don't know what I thought was going to happen. But it, that was really great. That was a really great suggestion as just something small I could do to bring a bit of myself into work. Um, and feel that the people I was spending my days with kind of knew who I was. Um, so there you go. That's my answer. That's a good answer. And yeah, shout out to Jonathan, um, who's, you know, everyone's saviour. Um, but it's true, like just those little things like that um, can make such a big difference and they impact kind of everyone you interact with in big and small ways as well as they like change the way you feel about what you're bringing um to you to like yeah to work but also to your life and self um so Winnie I'm interested in I'm interested in your answer to the question how do you think by visibility has like developed in your lifetime but also I think you and I shared the experience of like being kind of visibly not straight because we're in relationships with, with women and people like see that and understand that but still being kind of invisible or like you know like like Sue was saying needing to assert your bisexuality to have it read in the right way and um, so yeah I wondered if you would like to speak a bit about visibility <laughs> yeah yeah so I I totally agree um I also think that by visibility bisexuality has become more visible um over time um even even just you know from when I was at school to now I think yeah there's a lot more um celebrities coming out as bi um and also you know expressing other gender identities that aren't just binary so it, it goes across like sexuality and gender um there's a lot more openness in that regard um and yeah, with like younger uh, celebrities as well. Um, there, there's a lot more of this, and it's not necessarily like such a taboo either. It's not like scandal, like this clickbait article or anything, you know. Um, whether it's always good uh, visibility is another thing. I agree with Sue. Like, it's all too often that there's the bisexual character who either is ex either people read it as oh they were secretly gay all, all along or they were secretly straight all along or just in general just only ever having the representation of them cheating and not actually being able to have healthy monogamous relationships that may or may not change over the course of their life um 
so I think that's quite difficult uh, to to still find like really good representation. And while I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing to have you know representation of that, it's like if that's your only representation, it just it becomes the only thing people associate with that demographic. Um, and obviously people are complicated creatures. Uh, there's like such diversity within any demographic. It's not a monolith. Um, so will there be people who do that? Yes, but there is also so many other behaviors as well. Um, for myself, uh, yeah, like I, I've become um, more open about being bi over time. Um, you know, I think school is a tricky time for, for many people. Uh, I, I was outed and then I had to deny it uh, because I didn't feel like this was the way or the time that was right for me. Um, it, it wasn't a great time or method uh, to come out. Um, so I really only came out um, when I got to university um, and I came out to some of my friends uh, that I knew before that, um, but uh, but yeah, um, it was it was all still kind of very secretive, I, I suppose. Um, and then when I moved city, I was living away from home. I it was quite removed from my previous life, as it were. So it was almost like I was able to be this very open uh, person uh, in that regard. Um, so, yeah, I mean that that has changed somewhat. Obviously, now that I've I'm in a, a monogamous relationship with a woman, it, yeah, like you know, people assume that um, we're lesbians, um, and I guess it's one of those tricky things, you know, like you don't. This is an assumption that people make, but it's not like it's not like a regular conversation to go. Oh no, actually, my sexuality, like. <laughs> Or, or go into your dating history, by the way, um, <laughs> you know, it's it's not something that generally comes up in uh, everyday conversation. Um, and yeah, it's uh, only if someone actually says, oh, like, uh, as a lesbian or something, and I'll be like, no, actually, uh, <laughs> and I'll stop them and correct them. But, you know, the rest of the time, it doesn't really come up. Um, so... Uh, so yeah, it's not really something that I pay uh, that much attention to. Um, yeah, it was uh, when I was at university, um, I spent much of it single. Um, and so maybe in that sense, it was more visible. And I was uh, the bi rep for um, the university society for a bit as well. So, you know, yeah, it was... Uh, I was definitely saying, like, I was the bee in this LGBT society. Oh, that's a good, uh, thank you so much for sharing. Um, and uh, I'm sorry that you were outed, that's horrible, but you um, clearly are doing pretty well now, um, so that's good. Um, and it is a thing that happens to people, um, unfortunately. Um, I So I wanted to talk about activism because you talked about being the bi rep um and, but i'd also like to hear i don't know that we heard dave or sue's coming out stories uh, so if you feel comfortable sharing i'd love to hear them but if not then we can move straight on to activism uh dealer's choice no i'm the dealer um opposite of dealer's choice <laughs> dave um, do you want to go okay um Sorry, so one of the problems of the, the history is quite a long time ago. But I mean, coming out wasn't a single thing. It didn't just happen once. You know, it comes, you know, to do it again and again. So, and um, particularly as bisexual issue in a monogamous relationship, coming out is uh, an ongoing process. And so I haven't done it very much recently, apart from appearing in public on things like this. Which, <laughs> um, but uh, I don't know. You know, it's just a question of coming out to whom and in what forum. And it's. Uh, um, I made a lot of friends through the Bi Network. I guess I had some other friends, and I was, came out to them by saying, "Well, I was involved in Bi activism, so that's what I did, and that, um, that was the way which I kept coming out." Um, that's about all, all I can say on that. I think, um, Sue, so, don't know about you. Yeah, I, it, 
I totally agree with you about the the multiple comings out to different audiences at different times. I came out, I went to a boarding school and so I shared a boarding house with a bunch of girls. We slept in dormitories, you know, and stuff. So I was nervous telling them that I was bi, that they would think I was a pervert and that I had been, you know, eyeing them up secretly in the showers or something horrible like that. That was quite nerve wracking, but uh, actually turned out to be fine. And um, I don't remember their response apart from that. I think they thought I was being awfully serious and it was just a bit silly, you know, <laughs> but certainly, you know, my worst fears weren't realized. I think it was hugely easier for me as a woman coming out as bi than than it would have been for a guy especially at a boarding school. Um, uh, I don't remember there being any, any guys at school who were out as gay or bi when I was there. Um, I left school in 1997. Um, so yeah, and then, and then at uni, I don't know, it was easy. Um, it was easy. I just, I don't know. I just felt like everyone who knew me knew that I was bi. Um, but I never came out to my parents. Uh, not, I just never had a reason to. I never took a girlfriend home. Um, never really took a boyfriend home either until my husband, as I say, we got married at 25. You know, we were together from the, from when I was like 22 or something. So, um, so it was just off their radar. And now I think they might know, but only because I think my mum follows me on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but we've never had a conversation about it. And I don't imagine that we ever will because I think they think it's my private business maybe, or, or they just don't know. Yeah. Do you think, this is a question for all of you, do you think coming out in, in, in scare quotes is like a useful kind of idea and do you think it's different being bisexual and you know having to kind of assert your bisexuality in most cases because yeah because we're often in monogamous relationships and by very definition that's with one one sex gender whatever is it kind of more important for that visibility that we do like coming out or I don't know what do you think I, I just sorry is it okay if I jump in I I quite like non-verbal ways of being out you know so I just think that um you know I'll wear like a like a buy badge and I think social meet like I do quite a lot of stuff on Twitter for work. And so that's a really great place to be out because you can have it in your Twitter bio and you can put up the events like this, or, you know, you can kind of use the by visibility day hashtag and stuff, you know, so those, I definitely feel more comfortable with just making sure that there's stuff all around that anyone with any sense would see as clues instead of having to verbally like announce it, like, like I'm expecting a sort of reaction from someone or something. I think, I think apart from anything else, you know, I do, like what is someone meant to say, oh, great, or, oh no, or, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> you know, so I feel like, oh, I just, great. yeah, like I feel like I just sort of leave things around and hopefully they'll get the picture. I love that, like a, a trail of breadcrumbs and at the end it says, I'm by Pink and purple things just scattered everywhere in my in my room, basically, yeah. Um, I, I saw Winnie nodding. Uh, did you have anything to, to add to that kind of uh, contribution from Sue? Um, I mean, I would love it if everyone just like congratulated me every time. Um, that, that would be a great reaction. Like, here's, here's your cake. Uh, uh, <laughs> but... Um, but no, I, I feel like coming out is a difficult thing. I think all the media portrayals of it are some kind of grand event where you like sit everyone down that you care about. There's all this fanfare, everyone's crying and hugging and 
I, I I don't know. It's it's a difficult one because um I mean yeah like when I told my two best friends um at the time uh I they they just went oh well we didn't know but thanks for telling us and it was just a nice quiet affair and, uh, that that was basically a nice reaction and it was just that's that um you know I I uh I think it. It's, it's a tricky one because I don't think that you can just have this one event and then that's it because you'll meet new people you'll kind of have to keep doing this um there there are also you know times when if if it's uh, someone that doesn't kind of quite believe it or is in some denial you might need to like reinforce it by actually just coming out multiple times uh, to the same person and I think it's it's a tricky thing because there is not kind of a template for it just being, you know, this like matter of fact thing without it being blown up into this some some sort of drama, um, which very much isn't me. So like, you know, I, I I would just like it to be like this, like, yeah, that that that's it, you know, like this is just a statement, like <laughs> there's nothing more to this. Um so yeah, you know, it's it's a it's a weird one, for sure. Thanks, um, Dave. Do you have anything to add? Just just picking up on the idea of online communities and so forth. Um, it's not it's sort of been mentioned in passing in terms of Twitter and so forth. I'm just wondering if people find it easier to make contact with people via online, or not find it easier to be out in terms of online. Um, groups or forums. Um, I recall, um, so way before Facebook and that kind of social media, there was a thing called Usenet, which was basically an online forum. Um, and there's one called uh, for, for bisexuality, sock.vi, it's called, and make quite a few contacts and friends there and actually ended up with sort of people flying around the world to go and meet each other and have parties and so forth. So it's, um, I have photos of a party in my flat in Edinburgh, which I'm not going to share because it's private. But, uh, <laughs> um, not <laughs> rude, just so the people haven't given consent. Um, but you know, so so that was one thing. And now these days, you know, there's, there's um, buy.org on Facebook and um, quite a lot of other things around. So I'm just wondering if it's a bit easier either to make contact or to be out or to, you know, using these online forums. I think um, I think it is, but I think in some in some ways we're kind of recreating uh, things that you could do kind of in in I wanted to say meet space, which is a term I didn't want to use, but here we are <laughs> offline in offline spaces. Um, but speaking of photos of parties in your flat, um, I know Dave that you did have some pictures that uh, you were going to share. Maybe now is a good idea. Like now is a good time to. Okay. Have a look at those. Yeah, so I've got a few. Um, I'll, I'll keep it short. Um, but you mentioned activism, so I, I picked on those. So hopefully you can see this. Um, this is a photo of a uh, demonstration against AIDS. And I don't know the exact year. It's clearly World's AIDS Day. Um, it was organised by ACT UP Edinburgh, so AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power. Um, and I can say that of you know, these four people in that photo, um, including me, you may not recognize me, I'm on the left of the photo, um, uh, were in the Edinburgh bisexual group at the time. So that's uh, one way uh, of some activism joining there. There were a lot of different groups around in Edinburgh at the time, and we all pretended to work together. And there's an example there, you've got uh, a women's group, Scottish homosexual rights group, uh, the Green Party and so forth. Um, and uh, much of us, that's just before a very rainy demo. <laughs> um, they always tended to be at the foot of the mound. I'm not quite sure why, but I guess it was a fairly central place. And they tend to be quite small. So we're not talking like the size of the uh, Pride marches uh, even then, let alone the Pride marches now, which are much bigger. So this is the unveiling of the Lesbian, Gay and Bisexual Centre, the new shiny plaque there. That was on Borton Street. Um, I think it's now a restaurant. Um, well, that's uh, you know where a group, various groups used to meet, and I think Case Scotland was produced, the magazine was produced there for a while as well. Um, started in 1919. It basically came about as a result of working together with people and building coalitions, uh, which is absolutely key. Um, 
There's a very shiny plaque. I'm very impressed. <laughs> it was new. Uh, let me go to the this one. So this is the one I was talking about before. Uh, so I should see that. That's the um, just before a demo at the um, base of the mound uh, in a very rainy day. Uh, but you can see there's several groups working together, various banners all together. And, uh, do any of these groups still exist in the same kind of iteration or are they uh, consolidated so. into other groups? Uh, it sort of came and went. Um, I don't think any of them still exist. Um, somewhere there's a photo of uh, uh, another demo at the mound, which is um, where I'm holding one end of the Edinburgh Lesbian and Gay Society banner, as was at the time. And then it became the Bisexual Lesbian or Gay Society or blogs. And you know, it's clearly moved on to be staff pride since then. So um, I don't want to hog the whole meeting, but I don't want to share this one because it's quite fun. Um, this is another 1991. You'll see that. Um, so this is when we went to the American Bisexual Conference in San Francisco, and then we marched in the San Francisco Pride Parade, which was really quite something. Um, and later that year, I, pretty soon as that year, Robin Oakes, who's one of the leading American bisexual activists, came to speak at the um, UK National Bisexual Conference in Edinburgh. So that was really quite fun. Um, the other thing about activism, I would say, is that yeah, keep it fun, keep it in, keep it um, in enjoyment. And the last one, because uh, I think I'm next. I mentioned this earlier. This was the article we did for Scotland on Sunday. Um, so you can see uh, an interview there, and this is all trying to get the message out, of specifically about bisexuality, um, to the sort of if you like, a straight world. Um, so that's uh, actually one of the many, one of the, one of the few ways, to be honest, we managed to get our way uh, into the mainstream media. So. Thank you. That was such a great, like, little history snapshot there for you. Of, <laughs> of my history. Yeah, no, that's exactly what we're here for. <laughs> I'm just, um, I don't know that we've got any questions in the Q&A but I'm just going to have a quick look through the chat and maybe read out some of the comments so uh, there's and if anybody has any reactions or responses to them anybody in the panel that is oh I mean anybody just generally but um so we had a comment from uh Rebecca um saying my partner and I are both cis bi women and it's been really interesting going through fertility treatment often being referred to as lesbians or even stonewall fertility guidance referring referencing lesbians throughout the document it's hard to correct people without feeling like you're overly making a point of something when ultimately they mean two women in a relationship and I do kind of want to ask Winnie about this because I know I sort of bridle when my relationship is referred to as a lesbian relationship because I'm like neither of us <laughs> are lesbian. Yeah 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 it's like it's like uh you're incorrect on both counts like <laughs> you're not even right like half race um but yeah it, it, it is it is a like I, I guess for brevity I can see it but it's it's ultimately not accurate which yeah which does annoy me a little bit um I, uh, I I do think it's it's one of those things where with with many things like if if I'm just going to be seeing this stranger for like this one time in my life I won't bother like it's not worth the effort to correct them on you know whatever misconceptions they have about me um but yeah if if it's if it's something like going through a treatment like and you're going to be seeing the same people <laughs> it I can see this uh getting quite quite annoying um and you know like uh this is kind of so something that my partner of I have uh, and I have uh, spoken about um because we both would like uh children in the future um and yeah you know like it's either going to be going through this uh, fertility treatment um, or adopting. And in both cases, I can see this happening with us. Um, so yeah, it, it, is, it is tricky, especially if 
even from Stonewall, you know, like who who were in some ways the authority on on or you know like the one of the large voices in this conversation are referring it as lesbians. It's kind of hard to fall other places. Um, I mean, not not entirely this, but uh, I I do find it funny um, when I go to the doctors. Uh, like I think. I went to, to the doctors a while ago um, anyway, and uh, I think it, it did come up kind of like, uh, do I use any medicine? Do I use contraception? And I was like, nope. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, they're, they're like, uh, well, uh, okay, like, um, are, are you are you sexually active? And I was like, yep. And then they're like, try to, you know, work it out. You can see the cogs. <laughs> yeah yeah like that meme um and uh <laughs> and I, I was like yeah I, I I have a girlfriend and uh and the nurse you know she was she was great she was just like oh okay great um uh we we do not have a tick box for that uh but I'll put it in the notes and um they they could just ask me if they they need need to clarify it <laughs> and it's just like I love that there's not a tick box you know like not necessary <laughs> that's, that's kind of alarming <laughs> right <laughs> can I ask quickly how what do you think about the phrase same sex couple is that something you would think is a good solution or is it a bit I don't know what do you think of it I I think it's fine um I mean I I still do consider myself to be a cis woman but with kind of a lot of um a lot more visibility with gender identity it is something that I kind of have wondered about as well whether non-binary would um kind of describe me in a more uh, accurate way, but I I haven't really quite made a decision either way. And and again, it is one of those things. Like if you've spent you know your whole life kind of saying that you're uh, a woman, it's kind of hard to then shift your identity. Like like what we've uh, spoken about, but with bisexuality uh, before. Um, so I guess I guess that's not without its issues, obviously. But yeah. then I guess. I guess there is kind of like, well, I I wonder if I can identify as both uh, a woman in some ways and non-binary in others. Uh, it, it all gets a bit murky, to be honest. <laughs> I, I think it's a better solution than lesbians. <laughs> I, I would agree. Yeah, I think, Winnie, we need to take this discussion offline as we're both out here with Shive and in, in our names. <laughs> and we do have a quick question from an anonymous attendee um, who says, as a bi person in a relationship with someone of the opposite sex, those opportunities to correct people don't come up. Um, so how do you stop people assuming that you're straight? Uh, this is this one going out to uh, Dave and Sue. Dave has an answer in having a prominently displayed bi flag, I think. <laughs> but um, are there any other kind of tips and tricks? Well, I think um, Sue answered this quite well in terms of leaving breadcrumbs lying, you know, clues lying around, or wearing a badge or something. It, um, I, I must admit, I don't do it very much um, and uh, just got kind of used to it and, and living in that way myself at the moment. Um, so I probably surprise people from time to time by doing something like this or advertising this on Facebook or mentioning it in, in uh, uh, work and so forth. Oh, God, yeah. Um, so, so it is difficult, um, and again, you know, if you're involved with a community, you, it's easier to say, well, I'm going to the buy group tonight or whatever, and it's uh, uh, one way of doing it. If, you, so if you've got some sort of social forum, or if you come up and say, I was talking to someone on the Facebook group, X, Y, Z, you know, there are ways you could do it that way, I guess. Um, but um, I'll say the other thing to do is, is, as Sue suggested, you know, have, have some pretty obvious clues around or buy flags lying around or whatever. Um, is that right, Sue? Do you think that's the best uh, way to do it? I think so. I think I'd only, I can't imagine saying something direct unless they specifically said, because you're straight or since you're straight. And then I would be like, no, I am not. And, and that would be fine. But most of the time it's assumed, but not spoken about, you know? So, um, 
you can't, you can't well I feel I can't jump in and say I think you might be assuming I'm straight right now <laughs> <laughs> um I did I did want to say something as well about presentation because I saw that someone had put a comment about being a femme presenting woman as being part of appearing straight and I this is something I hadn't mentioned but a, a, I think around the time that I was really wanting to be much more out as by one of the things that I did was change my hair right so I, I shaved off half my hair and I had it I had a big shave bit on this side and I cut it short and you know and it was really like wanting to be visibly queer basically um and that was quite useful I think I think people flipped over into assuming that I was a lesbian um uh but I was actually quite happy about that because I was just trying to escape being in the straight box, I think, you know, like I was happy with any LGBT box that they would put me in because it was just, you know, where I wanted to be. Um, so that I suppose that's the only other thing is that there are sometimes things, not that you should have to manipulate your appearance in order to, um, in order to change people's assumptions about you but it is one of the tools in your kind of toolkit I suppose um, and that can be a useful thing as well sometimes yeah definitely yeah there's definitely kind of signals you can send without it being kind of super like I don't know constructed or anything like that but I think uh, I guess what it comes down to is if people are kind of in your life then you will drop those breadcrumbs and they will they'll work it out and if they don't then maybe you eventually have to sit them down and be like listen <laughs> but also you know there's no obligation to do that either we're just just out here living our lives being varying levels of visible depending on like our circumstances and you know the communities we're, we've been we didn't talk too much about that um I, don't, I think we have like somewhat run out of time so we'll just have to schedule a sequel to this event where we we dig into some more topics um but yeah I I think um it's just so nice to have events like this and kind of groups and conversations with fellow bisexuals and I think that's a really important way to do activism um and just expressing those identities identities that don't get so um well expressed well you know well publicly expressed I'm doing a very good job of publicly expressing myself right now as ever <laughs> But yeah, I think we'll we'll wrap up on that note. Um, thanks again so much to our amazing panelists, Dave and Sue and Winnie for sharing your thoughts so candidly and interestingly. Thanks as ever to everyone else in the Staff Pride Network um, for doing so much work to help put these events together. And thanks to all the audience for coming along and hearing some Bi Plus history. It's been a really, really lovely evening. Thank you very much. Thank, yeah, you, thank you, Sarah. Thanks. Thank you, Winnie and Dave. I loved hearing yeah. your stories. It was great. Yeah, likewise.